and let me share the screen. Okay, and when you share the screen, Zoom, screw up your view. Okay, so you should see my agenda, right? The doc on the screen. Yep. Okay, good. I'm just trying to revert back the configuration. Okay, I have to live with this uh, really narrow view of your guy. Right, so let's start. Um, so let's start with the questions or uh, issues. So the usual open forum, if you have any issues to, to raise any problems, any questions. It seems not. So I just prepared this agenda on the, um, based on the issues and pull requests that we uh, already took a look uh, during the last uh, meeting. Uh, I even took a look at the, the, the StreamZ um, operator uh, uh, GitHub repo to see if there were some other, I don't know, urgent issues or pull requests to, to dig into. I didn't find any, to be honest. So let's see what's the status of the ones that we already checked the last time. So this first one is about merging the wait for observed and readiness method in deployment operator. I guess that here it's waiting for uh, Jacob review and there is a Tom review as well here. But the latest updated was, I don't know, 30 days ago. So Tom, have you any hints on this or? Uh, I think um, we're basically just waiting for Shobam to take that forward, was my recollection from last time. And he's uh, away this week. So okay. maybe he just didn't manage to uh, progress that before he went. Okay, thank you, Dom. Next one. Yeah, it's so almost related to the um, to the um, to the discussion that we had last time about the default replication factor. There is this PR which is uh, in draft from uh, Stanislav. Uh, I think that I have on the agenda the issue as well that was opened by Jakub. So I guess that uh, for now, this PR has to stay as it is. So uh, just open in a draft and uh, we have to make a decision about, uh, uh, yeah, how to set the default replication factor uh, if we want to have this change. Um, let's discuss this uh, in the um, uh, issue. Yes, this here in the agenda. So I would say if you agree that uh, this PR has to stay as it is, so open and draft mode and waiting for a decision, right? Okay, I guess the silence is agreement, as Jakub always said, right? So. The next one is about the bridge. Uh, I don't know if Stanislav is on the call because uh, it's approved. I left a couple of comments. Uh, so I guess that this PR is waiting for uh, changes 
from uh, Stanislav, and then I guess that we can uh, can merge the, this one. I don't think Stanislav's on the call. Okay, thank you, Kit. And even because I cannot see the list of all the attendees right now. I have to improve my Zoom skills. Um, so, okay, and uh, so called the usual suspect, which I guess is going to be about, uh, yeah, this yeah, is the this Kafka is roller. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the, the, nothing's changed here yet. I'm hoping that as a result of the changes to the Kafka role that I'm making, that it's fairly easy to add a existence check on the Kafka resource into that, um, which I think will be a, a smaller change than what's proposed here. Um, so yeah. So you are proposing to to close this PR or and uh, having you a simpler change for that. Yes, but I'd rather leave this open until I've at least got that um, PR implemented, because at least that way it doesn't, you know, drop off the radar in any way. Okay. So Tom, it will stay still assigned to you this uh, pull request, and yeah, waiting for you when when you have time for that. Yeah, hopefully we'll see some progress on that in the next couple of weeks. Cool. So uh, on my list, no more uh, open PRs and issues. Uh, I don't know if you have any, uh, but I guess not. So let's move on to open proposals. Um, the first one is about, uh, I guess, the yeah, the custom authentication. There is ongoing discussion with the Tom and uh, Jakub. I have to review this one. Uh, so yeah, I will review. And uh, Tom, uh, you are waiting for some feedback from uh, the person who submitted the proposal. Hang on, I'm just trying to uh, remember where I got to with this one. Uh, yeah, I think I mostly... Know... Go, go on, on go Jakub, on. sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, he pinged Jakub uh, three days ago or some uh, some day ago, and yeah. uh, he worked in the changes which was requested. Okay, so it means that uh, it needs a new pass from Jakub, from Tom, and uh, yeah, I will, uh, I will have time for this as well, or any other. If any other has time to to take a look at this proposal, please do. Yeah, thanks, Jakub. And then I, yesterday I picked this one, which is kind of old uh, and is still in draft because uh, Kate, you mentioned something around the service binding, right? Yes. So um, I went to the service binding operator community meeting last week and um, discussed with them this proposal and the example that there's an example in their repository for integration with Strimsy. And it sounds like they're close to having their first release of the service binding operator. Um, so I haven't had a chance this week, but hopefully in the next week or so, I'll be, well, I am having some discussions with some of the community members, but also I'm hoping I can put in an update to that proposal to align it with the changes that went into Strimsy around the advertised listeners, but also 
so that it aligns with the version one release that's going to come out of service binding operator because I think a few things have changed since that proposal was originally proposed in the service binding operator spec as well. Okay, so uh, I can assign this to you, and I guess that this proposal is going to have some changes on your side, right? Um, yeah, because it, it's definitely out of date because the listeners, um, how they're listed in the status has definitely changed since that proposal was raised um, because we now have the like named listeners rather than it being set types and things like that. So yeah, um, yeah. but yeah, I've got some discussions uh, today actually with... Um, some of the community members just to kind of get me updated on where the specs got to and things like that. Okay, so cool. Uh, if you are okay, I will assign this to you. Uh, yeah, take fine. care of this. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Kate. Any other comments on these open proposals? Seems not. So this is the, the issue that I was mentioning before uh, around what we should do with the, the default replication factor. Uh, this was raised by Jakub from the, the latest uh, uh, call that we had. I had just one comment around uh, the profiles that maybe Mikkel mentioned last time. Um, yeah, we should just pay attention that uh, if we want to add the profile in the, in the Kafka custom resource to specify it's uh, a development or production profile with, so with different replication factor, uh, we have any way to match and check that the user hasn't changed the same default values in the Kafka config because it's possible today to, to change them in the using the default replication factor and minimizing replicas there. So we have just to, to check. I like the idea of profiles. I don't know the ideas from the others. And I don't know if you want to wait for Yaku to join next week instead of talking today and then talking again in two weeks. So what's your thoughts, guys? I'm not convinced that profiles are necessarily a good idea because then it doesn't it just make it harder for people to know what the default is and therefore push them into having to be explicit so that they do know what the default is. Yeah, that was my concern related to the Kafka configuration, because at that point, you don't know, you have to, to be clear, at least in the documentation, to know if you set the profile then you are kind of overriding what you are setting in the Kafka config or vice versa, right? If we yeah, want so to I think, I think the, the I think the Kafka config should always take precedence over, you know, sort of anything um, less explicit. Um, so if they've set the default replication factor in Kafka config or the min and sync replicas, then, you know, that's what we should use. It's... But you know, obviously, in order to set those things, then people have to sort of realize that they need to set them. So I think this would be a better out of the box experience for people who are just sort of spinning something, something up with you know a replica factor of um, sorry replication. Again, replication is is a bit of an overloaded term. What I mean is a three broker cluster, um, or you know a four broker cluster or whatever. Um, which still might be a you know a development sort of scenario, but um, when the default replication factor or min and sync replicas aren't given in the Kafka config, um, we would just use the min of three and the um, re replica count of the Kafka CR um, as the de as the defaults, which would basically mean that it works nicer with the new um, Kafka defaults, I think. How would a user discover what the current default value is? Um, presumably, they'd have to query the broker to find out what the current configuration was. Um, yeah, I guess they would. I guess what I'm wondering is, is it OK for us to just document 
this or because it's not a static number do we yes and it's consider it's how different to find out what it it's is sort of it would be different from the default that happens if you just sort of spin up brokers without sort of setting anything yourself explicitly um so yes we would need to document it somewhere but you know again it sort of boils down to the fact that either people know they need to set these things themselves in which case they're setting them themselves to whatever it is that they want or they don't know in which case they're not in which case the current experience is is less than it could be yeah i suppose as long as the um spec cam for kafka config is like higher priority then the recommendation can be basically effectively Strimzy is putting in sensible defaults for you but if you're running any sort of production system then it probably makes sense for you to set this yourself because then you know exactly what it's set to yeah yeah and what about the the, the mean isr do we want to follow the the idea of having the replication factor minus one i guess that that's a good one that's the the way for example that the canary works today to set uh, the 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 yeah the mean in, uh, in sync for the for the streams canary topic is that not a bit more opinionated than we might want to go though yeah that yeah. might be what's the kafka default value for min in sync it's one right okay. or or it's changed in the latest kafka no, I think they keep the defaults based on this idea that you need to be able to use a, a single node cluster. So when you you know when it comes up, you can use it without things falling over. And that makes complete sense for Kafka because they don't know how many brokers you're going to spin up, whereas Strimzy is in a position to know that oh, we're spinning up, you know, one broker or three or five or whatever. And so it is possible to sort of be a little bit more um, opinionated. It's, yeah, it's just, yeah, how far we want to go with that. And I think, you know, realistically, it, it is only these two configs that I can think of off the top of my head that where we would want to sort of do this. So I would say that right now there is a kind of agreement on the replication factor, which is going to be the mean between tree and replica count, right? And uh, not going through the profiles idea. Well, unless someone wants to argue that that's going to result in a better user experience, but I just, I just think it makes the situation, you know, more confusing because then it just brings a whole new concept in where now you know the i suppose one way to do the profiles that would be less complicated because almost what the profiles is suggesting is kind of here's some example configurations we could have actual examples that say if you're running a development and you want to set these yourselves, this is what we would recommend. If you're running a production system, this is kind of the minimum we recommend. That gets maybe a bit tricky because then if someone takes your recommendations and find that for some reason it doesn't work for their use case, I don't know what you do at that point, but ultimately if we did think that we needed to give people additional help, that could be a way to do it. Yeah, I think it's a good point because, like, uh, you know, as a user, how do you know what to set for production use cases? Um, so in the Kafka doc, there's a there's a small section of like here's an example for production have a config, um, and it lists a few other parameters as well you may want to 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 set. Um, so uh, so I feel like having something similar may be a good idea. Yeah, I think it's easier to be a, sort of opinionated in documentation where ultimately it's still the user that is going to take that and put it into their environment, whatever it is, um, as you know, rather than 
um, defaulting something where you know obviously we're taking some sort of decision for them and assuming that they know how to override that if they want to but it, Whereas, you know, if you're copying something out of the dock and sort of using that, then you're you're a bit more actively involved in, oh, well, I'm setting these things. What other things might I need to be setting? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, I think the only thing is uh, you want to notice that section in the dock before you start your cluster. Uh, I mean, in, I mean, typically you would have... Uh, smaller values for replica count and min ISR, so it's not too bad to increase that. Uh, you know. So it seems that there is no agreement at all or using profiles or not. Do we want to, to take more time to think about this and, uh, and maybe uh, continue the discussion on the issue upstream? It sounds to me like there's a general consensus that we don't necessarily want profiles, but that we need a good way to recommend people settings. And it's just a case of how do we do that in a way that means they'll see it and it will be useful to them. But I think you're right. Continuing the discussion on the issue makes sense. I think overall what was proposed in, in Yeko's uh, 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 proposal, it makes sense that the replication factor has a max of uh, three to replica count and, uh, and the mini is thought to be the max of one of and a replication factor minus one. I think this makes sense. Um, then a, a new, uh, I think we agree that yeah, profile may not be uh, the best idea because it sort of hides uh, what you should know if you want to deploy this in production. And, and uh, maybe that's where the docs uh, go over this gap. Yeah, so it sounds like we do agree that we should do what's described in the issue, possibly with some documentation work to have uh, maybe two um, example configs. Uh, we do say a bit on this in the doc. So in the um, in the tuning broker tuning configuration section, we do recommend that you uh, set the minimum number of in sync in sync replicas to one less than the replication factor. In fact, I think we say it in in more than one place. But maybe we can highlight that all. Bring yeah, I mean, really. The documentation aspect is kind of like as an alternative to the profile idea, isn't it? Yeah. And it does kind of assume that we've got, um, that we're opinionated enough to sort of say that this is what a production, um, you know, basically these are the differences between a development and a production environment. And, you know, neither of them is going to be, uh, the risk of, of, you know, sort of being that assertive is that people sort of take that and only that as sort of some sort of gospel truth rather than seeing it as a starting point of, okay, so this is roughly what I need for production, but what are my actual needs? If they've got documentation that sort of says that this is what production settings look like, then, you know, they can just think, oh, okay, that's, that's what I need to copy and paste in here. And they don't really engage, you know, higher thought process around is does this actually work for me for what I'm trying to do when when it comes to have uh, more documentation to explain uh, how the streaming operator is behaving uh, uh, for this configuration so for example it's making a choice for you right could it make sense to start to think having something in the status of the Kafka custom resource so saying uh, something like you have not set the replication factor. So I have chosen for you that the replication factor is this and mean ISR is this. So that, that it's clear on the status and not just reading the documentation. I'm not convinced by that because there's a lot of information already in the status. Um, so people might well not see it. 
um, or might not realize what it means because you know they're really just interested in getting their um, bootstrap servers config or their you know SSL um, trusted certs or whatever from the the status I think just you know it's operators are a bit frustrating because there are you know you've only really got the option of logs and the status for sort of getting information back um, to you know whoever is configuring their the custom resource but I'm not sure the answer is always you know chuck it in the status yeah but not always people take a look at documentation right so the answer yeah, well, in that case is take a look at the documentation while you have everything in your status but you could you could put something in all these places and you still wouldn't guarantee that people saw it ultimately you know you can't save people from themselves i'm thinking even in case where i don't know people are using some kind of automation on their side so this kafka custom resource is created by another tool that we are, they are using and they want to get this information in a more automated way and not because their software can read the documentation. So that was the, 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 the reasoning about having what the, the streaming operator decided for you in the status that sometimes can be useful for this use cases. Maybe it was just an idea, just, yeah, just thinking aloud. If you are a user, yes, you can read the documentation. If you are a software and you are creating a Kafka custom resource and you didn't set some configuration parameter, but you would like to know what are the result of, a, for example, in this case, the replication factor and ISR, you would like to read from somewhere and this somewhere could be the status. It also means that at some point we can have this status filled by a lot of information. That's, that's true. I mean, in a way, this is all a bit back to front in that how people configure their um, their topics in particular, because I think you know that's sort of kind of what we're really talking about in a way, is they they configure a topic in order to achieve a certain semantic. So that might be sort of um, you know sort of high availability is is why you'd want you know multiple replicas and the min isr set and so really what you want is for it to appear in the topic resource um if you know sort of what the the semantics of that topic are um right you know i think focusing on the kafka resource is kind of like it's in the wrong place I think that's a good not... point. Go ahead, Keith. So you you, you, you you could you could imagine, for example, in the in the Kafka topic spec being, you know, sort of wanting to be able to say, okay, assert that this configuration gives me a high availability topic. And if that assertion is not met, then the status would be, you know, not ready. Or you know there'd be some other condition in the the status to say you know what that it's not got the semantics that you want. I mean I'm thinking aloud here because uh, um, I can't think of any other kind of um, properties apart from sort of the high availability aspect because often you know you think about other aspects of a topic's configuration. And a lot of them are sort of non-functional, sort of performance-type things, um, where that that idea of being able to make assertions doesn't work because you can't guarantee the performance of. Yeah, I'm just uh, waffling here. I, th I think it's a good point that actually, so we're setting the defaults here, but ultimately, this is the default that's going to be applied if you create a topic without specifying the replication factor, right? So exactly. I wonder if a combination of what you said and what Paolo was suggesting, which is actually 
should the min and sync replicas and the um, replication factor be a status field in your topic? Because then you'll be able to see in the topic status, oh, this isn't set to the settings I was expecting. And then you can go and set that directly or you can go investigate how to change the default value. But it means we're not overloading the Kafka um, one, but actually the, the replication factor and the min in sync is quite an important setting, I would say, for a topic. So it feels maybe that's less um, like unexpected to have that listed in the topic status, maybe. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Though, it, yeah, that, that is an interesting idea. And you could also list the number of partitions, because I guess that's the other one that is kind of a key config option you want to know about your topic. And I guess I'm suggesting that if that you have it in the status either way, so either it will match what's in your topic configuration or it will match whatever the default is, but it just means it's you have one place always that you can look for the, that information about that topic. Although it doesn't help the users that don't use the topic operator. Well, I mean, they can always describe the topic themselves. They presumably know what they're doing. Like I say, you can't. can't save people from themselves. But I think that's, that's definitely worth exploring. Okay, I guess that it was a long discussion, even useful for that. Any other comments or thoughts? Um, so are we gonna, I think we've landed on going ahead with the changing the defaults to be dependent on the replica count. And um, we should, I guess, open a, another issue for this uh, idea around the Kafka topic um, to take that forward. Yeah. Is that, is that the correct summary, everyone? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I will update the issue uh, about this one, about going moving forward for this and see if uh, even Jakob will be okay and uh, opening a new one about this idea. Or uh, Kate, would you like to open this issue on the Streams repo? Yeah, I can open it. Thanks, Kate. Cool, thank you. Okay, so let's move forward on the annual review result uh, from the last um, meeting. Yeah, we had this, this feedback from the TOC and uh, still Kate, sorry, Kate, today I mentioned you a lot of times, uh, was going to, yeah, to help us on this. Any news or? So I had a little look at what's on um, the Strimz governance page at the moment. Um, and the governance repo is, is quite um, short and brief, I guess, in terms of the governance policy and what maintainers do. It kind of, it describes that they develop Strimz, which I, get, I guess most people would guess. Um, and it does talk about the voting process, but it doesn't give any other details of kind of what happens to get you to the point of voting. 
rereading the statement from the um, TAFC, I did wonder whether um, an onboarding process was onboarding, getting someone who's never contributed to the point to be a maintainer or whether it was a process for people who are about to be maintainers, like what they do as they become a maintainer. So I don't know if we need clarification on that. But what I did notice in my sort of having a look and reading is that actually in the main Strimsy repo, there is a section on contributing and that has quite a detailed section on what's involved in becoming a maintainer. So what are the kind of expectations beforehand of like how long you've been contributing and your knowledge and that sort of thing. So I was surprised that that wasn't in the governance section. It felt like there was maybe a disconnect there. And the other thing that I thought generally maybe was missing um, was we have the criteria of what you have to have done in order to become a maintainer but it doesn't actually, there's nowhere that seems to list in more detail the like ongoing responsibilities of, of being a maintainer. So I guess if I was a new person to the project, having a look at what's currently there, if I came to the Strimsy repo and clicked on contributing, I would see the information about being a maintainer, but um, from the governance page, I wouldn't necessarily find the, con the contributing guide. And then, I wouldn't know necessarily by reading the information what would be expected of me once I became a maintainer. So I wouldn't know, you know, is this a con is this a commitment that I'd be able to take on? I guess. Yeah, is that something that I want to do, or does that just look like a a millstone to wear around your neck? Um, yeah, those are good points. So I I suppose we could move um, some or possibly all of the contributing content to the governance repo. Um, so then, you know, so the, the, just to explain a little bit of the history around sort of the governance is we sort of, um, we kind of had a very minimal um, documentation originally um, when we joined the, uh, the sandbox um, mm -hmm. And we've sort of evolved it a little bit over time, introducing things like the component owners um, as the project sort of grown a little bit. And, you know, to try and ease the, the burden on um, maintainers uh, reviewing code. Um, so, you know, it's not as quite as minimal as it was before, but you're right. It is sort of very procedural sort of setting down exactly sort of how the project is governed. So, um, yeah, that's why I guess it doesn't really go into any of the details around sort of the more sort of broader contributing aspect. So we could move the contributing document um, into the governance repo um, and then sort of refer to it from the operators repo and, you know, potentially the others as well, because I think, you know, the, the content in there is is general to all the repos, really. Um, you're right about it's of nowhere really describing exactly what the um, the expectations around maintainers are. And I think um, ultimately it, that comes down to um, you know sort of code review and being able to you know who who has to sort of um, It's not just code review. Um, yeah, I don't think we necessarily yeah. need to kind of define <laughs> the role of maintainers here, but yeah, I, I guess if I was someone kind of going, oh, do I want to become a maintainer of Strimsy? It's not clear once I've worked through the criteria and gotten to the point of being able to be voted on, what do I have to do next? Like, I guess you could infer that oh okay well presumably you continue doing some of the things that you had to do to get there in the first place but it's not kind of uh, stated anywhere um i wonder if it's worth splitting out contributing and then becoming a maintainer into just two separate files just because um it then means it's kind yeah. of easier for people to go okay this is what i need to do to actually contribute and then we kind of almost have a link at the bottom that says, are you interested in becoming a maintainer? Then head over here. And there's kind of one place for people to go to learn about what maintainers do, 
the voting process and then how to work to become a maintainer. Yes, that sounds like a good idea because they're sort of different um, levels of contribution ultimately. Yeah. Um, also... it, it sort of sets out, you know, sort of the logical progression and wh what we would like to be a pathway. Um, but, you know, in practice at the moment, hasn't really been a pathway for many, many people have managed to follow. I think there's also a broken link on the contributing page. Um, the developer quick start guide doesn't seem to link to anything. Um, so that's under the Strimsy Kafka operator contributing. Yeah, there. Yeah, it moved into a subfolder developer docs a while back. Okay. And so that might be why that happened. Um, but yeah, so that was my kind of thoughts. But it did it did occur to me, I don't know if there was any more in the statement from the annual review other than the TOC encourages the maintainer onboarding process, because it, it occurred to me that does that onboarding process mean once you become a maintainer, this is how you get onboarded and given access to things? Um, I don't, I don't know. No, I, I can't think it does mean that, but unfortunately that's li literally all sort of all the, uh, all the info we've got from that meeting. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess all yeah. we can do then is in, interpret in, in the way that we interpret it and then see. I think one way we can approach this is to look at uh, over CNCF projects and uh, check their contributing and uh, governance pages. So I've been browsing those in uh, uh, the past five minutes and it, it looks like the streams one is not far off from some of these, but maybe uh, some of the other projects are more, um, more full description of uh, what, what happens and uh, what are the roles and how to be maintainers and all. Sorry, I was on mute. So the next step on this is, uh, Kate, you are going to propose some change around the contributing and governance relationship docs? Uh, yeah, so I can certainly look at raising PRs and things around moving stuff. I guess I'm probably not the best person to write something that's, that states what a maintainer has to do, as I'm not a maintainer. Um, so I don't know if one of the maintainers wants to put together. Uh, I will try and put something okay. together. Okay, thank you, Tom. So we are at the end. Uh, any other business from anyone? And this time silence should be not. So, yep. Thank you everyone for joining and see you in two weeks. Thanks for running the call today, Paolo. Thanks very much. Cheers, folks. Thanks, bye. Bye, Thanks, folks. Bye. 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 Bye.